Cairo. Mana has been Portland City Forester since 2012 and a public servant in the manager for over 25 years, including land manager, senior natural resource manager in New York City watershed, and region manager for Oregon Parks and Recreation. As Portland City Forester, she led implementation of the city's first comprehensive tree regulations, expanding the capacity, diversity, and professionalism of the city's urban forestry program, and spearheads improving forest services for low-income neighborhoods and communities of color. Jenner and her Bachelor of Science in Forest Foreign Service from Georgetown University and worked in Central Europe for earning Master of Public Administration from Syracuse University and Master of Science in Forestry from the State University of New York. Our next um, person, Damien Coe. <laughs> Damien is a Botanic Specialist 3 in the City of Portland's Environmental Services, where he has been managing natural areas and restoration projects to improve watershed health since 1996. His current work focuses on stewardship of natural areas in the Johnson Creek watershed and serves as the subject matter expert with planning, design, and construction sections of PES to help ensure ecological success of our natural areas. Damien has an environmental sciences degree from Portland State University. Our next panelist is George Kral. Forester, a regionally recognized expert in plant ecology of the Northern Willamette Valley. He has worked in the field over 30 years managing northwest riparian systems, upland forests, prairies, and wetlands. Through this work, George has collected, processed, propagated, and outplanted cones, fruits, seeds, and seedlings of millions of native trees, shrubs, and herbs. Uh, George and his wife Sarah own and manage Shoals Valley Native Nursery in western Washington County. Um, a focus of George's career has been the occurrence, proliferation, and significance of hybrids and woody genera such as Rosa Cretaceous and Corylus. George's primary research organism is the genus Alnus, its ecology, morphology, landscape, genomics, migration history, and recent climatic responses. And our fourth panelist is Hannah Schrager. <laughs> Hannah arrived in the Pacific Northwest before she could form memories. After her youth in the Columbia River Gorge, she set off to survey the terrain between Port Angeles and Port Orford. Her professional credentials include government scientist, rainforest ringleader, and now native plant propagator for the greater Portland region. Exploring native plants, stewarding them, and supporting others in doing so is how Hannah hopes to foster resilience and connectivity in her community. She currently serves as Metro's Native Plants Material Scientist. So, thank you all. So, we don't need a microphone, do we? No, okay, so everybody needs to speak up when you answer your questions, and also, uh, when we get to the audience question section, if you could stand up when you ask your question so that everyone can hear. So let's start off with a softball question here. And we'll, I'll go across and ask each person to give their answer to this question. The first question is, what do you see as the biggest climate change challenge in the next 10 years in your own work? OK, good. We're married on my work. OK. Um, I think one of the, for me, one of the biggest challenges is marrying what we know scientifically with the like the rapidity or the, the pace of climate change and trying to make like concrete decisions with science but knowing you can't have all of the metrics identified. So the uncertainty of climate change with, and the reaction of plants. Okay, great. George, uh, same question. What do you see as the biggest climate change challenge in the next 10 years in your work? Uh, understanding people. What <laughs> <laughs> so luck. <laughs> what what do people need? You know, what's good for people? Um, what's good for all of us together? And that's I think the challenge for me and for my wife Sarah as uh, well. We're both trying to kind of navigate this uh, this strange world that we're finding ourselves in. Uh, so yeah, we're listen we're wanting to listen to what you have to say. Great, Damien, same question. 
Um, yeah, some of it's defining what my work is. Um, I think that's changing as the climate changes, and so where that goes is kind of the biggest unknown. Um, I saw recently a video of Damien Lillard that had you know, a shirt on and said, nature is not a place to visit, it's where we live, or something like that. And so looking at all the functional values that we get from ecosystems, how they're gonna change with climate, and being able to predict that and react to that. Um, I think we need a whole set of um, planning, um, research, uh, funding for implementation. Like There needs to be a whole kind of broader network that supports this work and expands this work. Great, thank you. Jen? First, I have to say, go Damian Miller. Yeah, <laughs> pretty awesome. Talk about great marketing. <coughs> Unexpected avenue. Um, for our work in municipal urban forest management, I'd have to say it, our biggest challenge is dealing with the outcomes of a climate crisis on the forest and people who live in the forest. So what we know, we think we know from modeling and what we've seen is that summers are going to be hotter and drier, uh, winters stormier with more frequent and more intense weather events which have a lot of tree impacts. Um, trying to anticipate what those changes are going to be and how we're going to impact trees today and how we need to pivot to support our trees and the people who live in them around the city, as well as trying to figure out what should we be planting today in anticipation of the weather and climate patterns to come. Great, thank you. And for the second question, I guess Jen will start with you and we'll, we'll come back. So if you were given a $1 million grant, oh, prices are rising. Let's call it $2 million. <laughs> uh, if someone would give you a $2 million grant to try to address something within your power for the work you do on climate change, what would you spend it on? Yeah, um, this was actually a really, I was glad to get this question as an easy one. I would spend it on communication been on education and I will call it marketing around it's like a Damien Miller shirt with people like Damien Miller wearing it and trying to get more adherents and believers in the fact that nature is essential to all of us where we all live and everywhere else and how our decisions impact individual decisions impact nature that we all need it into the future that it is struggling declining um, and trying to put some hopefulness on it like we know that for young people, one of the primary sources of depression is about the climate crisis. How professionals would say, from what I have read, I'm not a psychologist, but the ways to navigate that kind of depression is to find things to do that are encouraging. Um, so there are many things we can do locally uh, to help diminish the effects of the climate crisis. I'll start with my big one. This was the, would be the lead for our marketing campaign or campaigns. Keep the trees you have, love them, take care of them. They are the canopy we have today. Planting trees is not the only thing we need to do. Planting trees brings our forests in decades to come. If we lose what we have now, we've, we've lost a lot. There. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Andy, what do you think? What do you do with your two million? Um, so I would, I would look into research and kind of pulling data together so that it's easily accessible. Um, I'd look at like functional assessments, uh, um, you know, our forest systems, what they're providing now, and how they're providing it, and whether they're impacted, um, so that practitioners have the ability to look at those and find out where we can make the improvements, um, and then, you know, tying the climate you know, change stuff into their, you know, things like, you know, extreme heat are causing, you know, really large impacts and set really, very really fast shifts, as, large, as well as, um, you know, winter weather and flooding and landslides and other things like that. So when we have these big events, whether it's a fire or a landslide, like, are we coming back? What, what's our power plants that we're using to plant these? What's our planting arrangement? Um, what's the carrying capacity of these lands? Um, and um, yes, providing all that information so that practitioners can 
practitioners to kind of plan, implement. Um, and I always put some money into implementation too. There's, there tends to be a lot of plans and not always um, hit the ground. Okay, great, thank you. George, how do you spend your two million? Just two? <laughs> how much do you want? I want a lot more. Uh, we spend it on politics. I can say it's kind of cheap. <laughs> you know, there are decisions about, there are policy decisions that are being made uh, at high levels, high political levels, uh, that are, be, they become the marching orders for our government. And until we begin to change the dynamic of that very narrow, economic focus of the next quarter or two quarters out. I, I don't really see, I mean, I, if, if I could do it in my ideal world, well, we wouldn't be in this situation. Uh, <laughs> but I, I would spend all that money on my own research, actually, because I enjoy that. But I question the value of it in a system that doesn't value my research. Uh, and so until we change the system, to begin to think about anything besides a very short-term economic gain, we're not getting anywhere, folks. <laughs> we don't, honestly, our government is owned, and it's not owned by us. So that's where I go with it. Okay, thanks. Anna, what do you think? I guess I might just echo Jen, and I think that climate change is like a cultural issue, and it's not. It's not going to be mitigated if you know culture doesn't shift, and so. I think like what the Backyard Habitat program in Portland has done to build stewardship and people that wouldn't maybe necessarily have thought about managing their small land that way, like that is a massive impact to the ecology of the area. And so some sort of outreach to connect more people to their their world and each other. Um, and then hopefully climate change. Okay, yeah. great, thank you. <laughs> So those are the two questions that I have prepared. We're going to go out to the audience next. To, um, hopefully, we'll have some some questions from the audience. We have plenty of time, and I'm enjoying being a game show host. <laughs> okay, um, Bruce. Hi, I'm, I'm Bruce Newton. Um Everything I read suggests that the scientists that study climate change and do the modeling have been consistently surprised at how wrong their forecasts have been and that the pace of climate change is accelerating and happening faster than any of their models were predicting. So if climate change is going to happen faster than we think, how do we plan for that? We have a tendency to sort of wait for things to die and then figure out what will work now to plant, um, not what might happen, what, what's the climate going to be like in 40 years, and how do we plan for that? And I don't have a panelist that I'm addressing this to. <laughs> yeah, um, what was your name again? Bruce. Bruce. Um, excellent observation. You're absolutely right. It's really difficult. Everything I've read recently also, like you, it seems to conclude that things are happening much more rapidly. Um, so, the way we try to navigate it is know that it is inherently uncertain. Uh, it is our job. It's a hard job. But we're going to put one foot in front of the other. And that starts with looking at what trees we have now in the ground here. How are they doing? Those are incredibly important for us to, to figure out what do we keep planting or stop planting. We also, years ago now, started uh, looking south for species to bring in to plant in Portland. Um, and we're finding that some of those are doing well, others not so well, so we don't do those anymore. So it's kind of a practical application approach, is what I would say. Um, we're also realizing that habitat is going to get more and more stressed and challenging. And in case you don't know, an urban environment is not any tree's probably favorite place to be. Uh, you'd rather be out in the, in the woods with. Um, yeah, well, there are some, there's some that do, know, do well no matter where they are, right? Like tree of But um, 
we are looking right now at, at what are our standards and for things like planting. Uh, it's a great example. I can't wait for us to get going on this, but city court and current street tree planting standards don't have anything about soil volume or texture. And anyone who knows plants know that knows that soil is absolutely critical to what your plants will be able to do from survival to, to flourishing. Um, so we've long wanted to change that, and it'll be a lot of work. It'll be some political work as well. Now we need to do it even more because we know that the climatic stress on plants here, no matter how well we try to plant, choose, um, will just increase. And so we need to give them every advantage that we can. Anyone else want to tackle this the rate of change? I'd toss a couple things in there. One uh, question, why? Why is the science missing the mark? And I guess, uh, you know, one thing that's worth noting is I think Exxon's uh, climate scientists actually got pretty right on. Uh, and of course, they're exploring engineering alternatives to climate change, which are deeply concerning. Um, but when you put that kind of pressure on science, when you essentially grant moral equivalency to crazy crackpot science, it becomes difficult to stand up and say, hey, wait, that doesn't jive with the numbers I'm seeing. When you put that constant pressure on science, scientists become a little bit cautious. Scientists are cautious a bunch anyway. So they tend to, you know, err on the side of caution and you know, try to, you know, look at the left hand side of the bell curve maybe. But um, so there's there's that you know we have to figure out how do we how do we be honest with each other right? when there's that much money in the balance then it's hard. Um, one thing I wanted to point out on this and this is important because if policy pushes in a different direction and Exxon gets their way and they come up with an engineering solution to climate change and we start squirting stuff into the stratosphere to try to reduce incoming solar radiation and so on and so forth. Which is honestly, I mean, we're going to see more and more and more of this. You're seeing more credence given to this kind of approach to climate change. All bets are off. I mean, how do you plan for that? You're trying to plan for what's happening four years down the road, but how do you know what you know, Rex Tillerson is going to pull up next, you know? These guys are going to be firing this stuff up in the stratosphere. I mean, my gosh, how do you, I don't know how to plan for that. Um, um, reminded to talk about fungi after a bit. <laughs> One of the reasons that some of your southern species aren't doing well, but I think we can have a chat about that. Southern species are doing well, for the most part, but mycology is really important. Yeah. Psyllium is really important. That to me is about soil, too. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else want to take a cut, or should we move on to I, the next? I would say a little bit like how we, how we look at how we care for the land. So we do a lot of what we call restoration. <clears throat> Now we don't really have a North Star anymore. You know, we used to have a kind of 1851 vegetation aspect. Now with climate change, we don't know where we're going. So rather than restoration, we're looking at stewardship. And so stewardship is a long-term investment. And so that we're there year after year, we're able to see which species are making it, which ones aren't, so we can replicate those. We can add new ones in. We can see what other people are doing, and, you know, kind of put this all together and kind of move forward as the climate change. Yeah, I guess I think, I feel like I personally keep like one foot in the projecting, planning, staying on top of what the science is saying, and another foot in the like creative response. Because people don't change unless they have to. And at some point we're gonna have to. Um, it would be nice if we could proactively change because we have all this information that's telling us to change, but look, like we're not, right? At any rate, it's like detectable. And so how do you react? How do you have like a set of tools that you are like, okay, it appears that, that we were accurate about that like phasing out. Um, maybe we were wrong, like Western Red Cedar, maybe we were wrong, like let's not totally eliminate planting that, but let's reduce it and then respond when we have you know more of a direction. And all models are wrong, right? Some are just more useful than others. So, uh, yeah, Exxon is. I mean, it's, it was. I think it's fascinating to see that we made a model. We this is what we thought would happen, and we blew it out of the water. That's still very, infor like, very informative, right? Like, yeah, just scary. Great. All right. Let's see, Mark. Um, a, a, a specific uh, uh, question. So, given climate change. 
we get we get thrown a, a, a curve. Um, <clears throat> what do you see as some potential specific uh, replacements for Oregon ash as as we move forward? And 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 why? If 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 there are any specific species being considered, you know, what about that species? Given all these other things we just talked about, make that a, a likely one. So, Mark, just going to set a little context for your question. Um, I'm sure probably a lot of people are aware that the emerald ash borer is uh, a pest that's being projected to make it eventually to Portland and wipe out pretty much all of the ash species, which, as we know, are a really important riparian component. Damien, I'm remembering a presentation you and Julie Bond gave a few years ago. I think it was. Uh, well, you, you did, or was it Dominic? Yeah. It's Dominic, right? yeah. Dominic and from the DES about what would happen to Johnson Creek and the Columbia Slough's riparian canopy if the Emerald Ash floor got here. So that's just setting a stage for talking about Oregon Ash. So anybody here want to pick up on Oregon Ash? We don't have to do you know, all four people for every question, but if anyone really wants to answer this particular question. I really want George to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm champion at the bit. Um, wow. What a mess. You know, there is a silver lining. No, there's no silver lining. But there is some reason for hope. Um, oak is the obvious answer. Uh, Quercus garyan, I mean, our Oregon white oak, Valley white oak here, um, is a good shoe in in a lot of places. And it's surprisingly more water tolerant um, than a lot of people think it might be. Um, and so it'll, it'll tolerate really quite hydric soils. Um, Unfortunately, there's a new insect, a relatively new insect, called the Mediterranean oak borer that's now attacking oaks, and, and, and its potential impacts are unknown. But this gets back again to the big policy picture. We have this system in the, on this planet, and I've heard this since I was old enough to acknowledge economics as a word, um, that we're going to a global economy. I mean, how many times have we heard this? Well, we're there now. We're way past there. But as I was growing up, we're going to a global economy. Never occurred to me to question that. I mean, nobody asked me, obviously. I'm sure they didn't ask you all either. Why are we going through the global economy? And what are the impacts of the global economy? Anyone with any plant sense, anyone with any ecological sense understands the potential nightmare that this that we've created. And not, it's not a potential nightmare. It's a nightmare uh, that's absolutely in full strength. I did a little tour. I like going to college campuses because you never know what you're going to find. Um, and I, I've laid out just a little display, and I, I know part of the topic here is assisted migration. Well, that already happened. We did that. Um, you know, I did a little survey um, several years ago of cultivated and ac accidentally introduced plants in the Willamette Valley, and I came up with, I, start, I stopped estimating once I hit about 25,000 species. So we brought 25,000 species into a system where we have about 1,000 taxa that are native here, species. In Subspecies. I don't know where we go with this, but you know the silver lining. This gets back to the, the, the Jim was referring to before. Uh, there are reasons for hope, and one of the reasons that might actually kind of perversely come from those twenty-five thousand plants that we've dragged in here. There's a lot of genetic diversity out there. A lot. Is the world going to look anything like it does today, fifty years from now? Oh my gosh, no. It's going to be a whole other planet out there. We won't even recognize it. If we come back in 100 years, we wouldn't know where we were. Um, but recombination is a huge, huge deal, right? It's a huge deal in plant population ecology. And it is the path forward. The path forward for ash ultimately is going to be, we're going to have some species of Fraxinus here, maybe multiple species of Fraxinus here. And we're going to have them here as a result of recombination and selection. Um, acting on millions and millions, countless millions of seeds and seedlings and young plants. But some of them are going to make it. So that's our, that's our hopeful note, right? We can look forward to that. That's a natural process. How that plays out, and these guys working on the ground are going to be, you know, setting the stage for a lot of that stuff. But we got to figure out how we work with that. Anyway, that's a, well, I can, I can tell you what we did this year when all the ash got quarantined. So George was growing like 20,000 trees for us, wasn't allowed to sell them to us. So we switched to black cottonwood, maybe some oak, 
And then what we decided to do, not necessarily with the batch we weren't allowed to buy, but is not eliminate ash from our planting palette because it, the emerald ash borer does not eliminate the tree. It takes it from a tree to a shrub. And so now we're thinking about ash, or well, the organ ash, as a habitat component that is no longer over, or, you know, upper overstory. It's not upper canopy, but now it's maybe a shrub layer. And then we have this whole back and forth about beavers yeah, with you. you. Yeah. yeah, and so we haven't, um, for, I guess it's just like, we don't necessarily know the outcome of like maybe a pathogen. And so trying to not say like, all right, that's dead. We're not doing that anymore. But like, all right, let's like put a damper on that. Um, and, and I'd say, yeah, we mostly switched to Cottonwood for Smith and Mighty. That's what we chose for there. In a pinch, we had to make a decision. I think it's probably because we had, but yeah. <laughs> I'd add to Cottonwood almost root growth. Um, okay. Yeah, but Alder, and there was a publication, I think, put out through Clean Water Services in Washington County um, exactly about this. And I cannot remember the author of the title, but those who are interested, I'm hopeful that you could find it online. Because they had four or five different species that they were thinking would be effective. Of course, they're experiencing EAD right now, whereas we are on the cusp of it. So I, I'd like to think that their firsthand experience is going to be really helpful. And they're really looking at the um, ecological riparian and habitat functions of ash when we lose them and what species could do well in those environs and also hopefully at least somewhat replace those functions. We, we stopped planting ash about seven years ago. Us too. So um, that was one of our, um, Johnson Creek's a little bit different. We don't have these long flooded time periods and so we have a lot of, there are a number of replacement species within Johnson Creek that you know, oak is a good one that we're starting to use more. Um, uh, ponderosa pine in some cases, a little bit higher than that. And then, um, uh, willow, Pacific willow in some cases, and then cottonwood in some cases. So we have more options, I think, generally in Johnson Creek than other watersheds. So, yeah, thanks. Okay, other questions? Give some perspective to Portland and the metro area regarding historically across the United States, urban area, urban forestry has often been sort of monoculture up until some period of the last 50 years or so. How does Portland fit into that? With climate change issues, how will that diversity recommendation change? Yeah. That's a great question. Sounds like you know a little bit about urban forestry. Um, so, Historically in the U.S., I can't speak to other countries, um, trees have been more amenities than infrastructure, um, and the amenity aspects, I think, have, have lent to aesthetics, and there's been a lot of concentration on matching trees, rows of this and rows of that. Um, we like the flowering ones, so let's do all of them, flowering cherries. Uh, that's something that the more science-oriented, forward-thinking, I would say, oriented parts of urban forest management um, have, have long known is not the best practice. So there have been standards in urban forestry best management practices for probably a good 20 years about species diversity. There's something called the 10-20-30 rule. It's about, you know, the species, genus, and family, what type of diversity we want. Portland is lacking in that. We have, we are overrepresented in our street trees. It's different on parks and natural areas. In our street trees by maples, whatever type of maple you choose to call out. Um, and we have known that because of our street tree inventory, which some of you may have been part of. It's often done by residents, uh, along with our staff, kind of guiding things. Um, and so uh, we have things called approved street tree species lists, and permits are required for good reasons, I think, so we can direct what the species should be. When people get permits and follow them, um, you will see there aren't maples on those lists because we're trying to get the distribution broader and have more species rather than fewer. Um, and it is the trend in urban forest management nationwide. It's the recognition that with diversity comes many benefits, including more sustainable and resilient forests in the future. And with climate change, how is that going to be more diverse recommendations? Yeah, um, there, I have not seen any published guidance on that. 
in the urban forest management vernacular. But my personal opinion is yes, the more diversity we have, the better. It's challenging to get a diverse forest. It takes a long time for a tree to be a tree, and that's a good thing in a lot of ways. Um, but it's really about future prospects. We still have too many maples in spite of, for years, knowing we need to mix it up. Um, so I think we're going to keep going in that direction. So we've got about five minutes Sorry, left. Too long. Um, like to get some more questions. Let's do one question, one panelist, see if we can get in several questions. Um, look. Oh, okay. Um, there's a lot of talk about changing up the plant palettes. Is there any work that's going on of working with our existing native species to make them more resilient? A good example is kind of like a ponderosa pine can actually tolerate a lot of water if that's what it grew up with and was used to. But on some of these restoration projects, you come in and flood an area, the ponderosas that were high and dry don't like that water. So it, it's like these species are capable of, of living in a broad range of, of kind of, you know, sites and existences. Is there any work kind of testing what the limits of these could be? Yes, George, George is the expert. Uh, yeah, uh, it, the, um, the, how far we push the dial depends on how much diversity there is within, within, the, within the population. Ponderosa pine is an excellent example. Yeah. Actually, Willamette Valley Ponderosa pine probably should be described as a fat wet species because it's associated with wet hydric sites. Uh, I can call it an enormous amount of water, but it's a great point. We're absolutely working, my wife Sarah and I are working on selections to try to find you know, more adapted uh, elements of the populations of plants that we have here right now. So it's a great point. It's absolutely where we look first. Cool. So, so George, you're doing a lot of work where you're you know, collecting seeds from drier, hotter climates and then growing them out that are still, like you can find, like the spur, you know, in Utah Valley, I don't know where to go, but. Not that far. But, but Sacramento, <coughs> or you know. Um, as close to home as possible as close to home as possible. There's a lot of diversity in these open pollinated, uh, you know, cross-fertilized species. There's an enormous amount of genetic diversity. Um, and so selecting from the diversity that we have right here, uh, and I know this is something that's gonna resonate with everybody here, uh, the more we can extract from, it's not just climate, right? So we got day length, we've got, you know, moisture regimes, which have not changed that much, except in the summertime. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's one of the reasons why fungi will sometimes really whack stuff that's off-site. So if we go down to California and we brought species up from California, we've got to throw them side by side, or even the same species, populations from either east or south, and they just get destroyed by fungi here. So anyway, mm -hmm. local is best as much as possible. Mm -hmm. So you're looking for local dryer sites? Local sites. hotter, local dryer, local, yeah. local, so local. For you're getting the genetic makeup that favors or does, does well in those sites that right. we can expect more of. Right, but the soils here haven't changed, right? Yeah, right. We still have more or less of the soils haven't responded yet to climate. Uh, the, the, the fungal uh, flora that we have here has not changed. So a lot of elements, of the, it's not just climate, there's all of the other elements to which our local populations are already adapted. So we toss all that out when we run down to Sacramento and drag stuff up. And then we're starting from scratch. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I think that's about all we have time for. Hannah, would you like to add something? Well, I would just like to say, I think there's like a diverse range of management happening here. So like Metro does not use species that are, are not native to the area, but we will use genetics that are more diverse. So well, we're not going to bring in a species that wouldn't normally grow here to, at this point. We're like ex ex exercising caution and bringing in um, different species, but the genetic exploration, I think you just got funded for something. Yeah, yeah that we're involved in. It. So, and, I, and then I think that's different than what Jen's doing. So I think it'll be interesting to see with all these different sort of management approaches, what we can learn. Okay, great. Let's have a hand for a panel. It's the 8th Annual Johnson Creek Science Symposium. I hope you all will come back next year for number 9. Um, and I know there's still more questions. I don't know, perhaps some of the panelists may stick around and 
answer questions for you. I want to say thank you very much and thank see you, you next year.